Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. A um, couple news items, real quick. Lexington paper, 36 ABC News, uh, 36, is reporting that a mine pleads guilty to put miners at risk. So, the official with the Eastern Kentucky Coal Mining Company pleaded guilty to federal charges that he put miners at risk. Mana Lappin Mining Company shipped foreman Bryant Massingale acknowledged Thursday that he failed to note hazardous conditions in inspection reports as required and failed to correct hazardous conditions. Lexington Herald Leader reported that Massingale worked at the company's P1 mine in Path Fork in Harlan County. A grand jury charged the company and three officials with exposing miners to the risk of injury or death by violating safety rules in June 2011. The company and two other officials have pleaded not guilty. A few weeks before the alleged acts listed in the indictment, 49-year-old David Parton of Pineville died when a section of the mine wall fell on him. So, uh, miners are going down. The uh, the miner, mining officials, uh, EPA coming in, they're charging all these crimes against them and good. You know, finally, the King Cole is... Uh, uh, there's a, a crack in the dam, so to speak. There's a hole in the boat, and uh, hopefully this this starts a, an avalanche. Hopefully this starts something. We should also be arresting bankers, you know, not just unsafe coal mine owners and operators and officials, uh, uh, but also bankers. How come we haven't started arresting any bankers? They, they don't mind arresting, you know, some protesters outside Chase Bank, but when has Chase Bank been arrested for all the evictions that they've thrown out? Another uh, article here by Cheryl Truman, or Cheryl, Cheryl, Cheryl Truman, Uncommonwealth of Thin, we're in here, Kentucky would be better off. <laughs> and this is an opinion piece, but it's uh, pointing out some recent facts that just came out. 30% um, of adults are obese in 12 different states, including our Commonwealth, including the bluegrass, including Kentucky. So at least 30% of Kentucky's adults are overweight or obese. Um, I get a little... A little bit there. Uh, 30% though. 30%. That's 3 out of 10. That's a lot of, a lot of fucking fat people. <laughs> a lot of fucking fat people in Kentucky. And Kentucky's a poor state, so, you know, I guess we're not, we're not as bad off as some third world countries. We could do better. We could do better, but, you know, we could be happy too. We can, we can enjoy our poverty and <laughs> enjoy our misery, our lack thereof. We don't have food and water. Who cares? Let's have a fucking party. We're Kentuckians. So, uh, Jane W. Burks wrote this article, and this is my last free article Courier Journal is threatening me with. It's the last free article. So, um, they've threatened with this before, and actually they do shut the whole thing down. I think it has to do with cookies or some shit, but actually I enabled my cookies. I don't know how they're trying to do this. I think they're trying to catch some of them, not catch the other. I don't know. I'm not going to fucking subscribe. I'm not going to pay for any of my information. I will get my other information. Uh, I will get my information about Louisville some other way. Okay, fuck the Courier Journal. It's mostly fucking corporate garbage, anyways. But this, I do find a lot of things that's in it that's pretty good. Uh, it doesn't stop them from you know having Confederate historical origins. Okay, they're co created by Confederates. George Prentiss, Confederate, which has got a statue right outside of the main branch library. Meanwhile, Abraham Lincoln's on the other side. Um, behind a bunch of trees, so we got George Prentice and Henry Water, or Henry or Harry Waterson, one of them. Waterson and George Prentice are both fucking Confederates, and they're dicks to the Germans. They're dicks to German uh, William Justice Goble. They're dicks in the 1855 riots. They caused the fucking riots. So, Kerr Journal is not without its share of bloodshed. Uh, anyways, <laughs> enough talking about bloodshed. There's a nice woman, actually, uh, Jane W. Burks. She's on the table, and she's, like, smiling. So she's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can use a, I guess, a vehicle. It's a media, so it's just information. It's just a tool, um, and it can be good or it can be a bad tool. So here's one good tool, one good piece of information. It says, this month, as more as 100,000 students return to our Jefferson County public schools, many of them will face more important challenges than finding the right school bus, learning a new locker combination, or deciding where to sit at lunch. As many as 11,000 school-aged children in Jefferson County will experience homelessness at some point during the year. 11,000, 11,000 children throughout the year will be homeless at some time. 
I was guessing about 10,000, but that means it's 11,000 plus at least because that's the adults that's all hiding in the trees and hiding by the church doors that are locked and uh, make sure nobody uses for six days a week. How come the church isn't used for six days a week? We have all this homeless. Couldn't they stay in the basement or something? Couldn't the doors be opened up? Couldn't you all do more? So for the children that are homeless, uh, can mean going to school without appropriate clothing or school supplies, going to bed and waking up hungry, often not knowing where they'll be sleeping that night. How can a child in this situation think about science, math, or English when life is so uncertain? The ongoing recession has increased the number of JCPS students facing homelessness. Parents and caregivers who are able to work have been laid off and struggle to find new jobs that pay a living wage. At the same time, there's a significant shortage of stable, affordable housing Available throughout our county, many are left with no choice but to double up with family members or friends or seek shelter with agencies such as Volunteers of America of Kentucky. So, there's homelessness. There's there's lots of homelessness. And it says there's 100 homeless families in uh, Volunteers of America of Kentucky, almost 250 children. But it said 11,000 school-age children will be homeless throughout the year. And I guess homelessness is a, uh, a fluid thing. You could be homeless one day and not homeless the next day. Uh, I was homeless last year. Um, last year I was in Louisville and uh, didn't have a place to stay, so I had to uh, bunk up with one of my former classmates uh, for about two weeks before I was able to find this place. So, you know, I've been there. I've been there. I know what it feels like to not have a place to go, and it fu it's fucking bullshit, okay? It's fucking bullshit. Um it sucks to have to stay with other folks too and it's uh you know no offense to anybody that's uh ever helped me out it's just that when you stay with somebody else it's like you're beholden to them you know you have to be like their bitch you have to be like extra nicer and you have no say so you have no fucking say so whatsoever um if you were to, like hey you know what i don't think uh i don't want to eat this meatloaf you all been eating meatloaf five times in a row when you're gonna start eating some fucking chicken or some steak some steak burritos and how come you all never drink milk? Always with the pop, always with the soda. You guys trying to get diabetes? Are you trying to get overweight? Are you trying to increase Kentucky's obesity problem? Epidemic? You want to make Kentucky's obesity epidemic worse? Come on, Kentucky. Come on. <laughs> um, this is the actual point of why I even want to even talk. Uh, the Student as Nigger by Jerry Farber. This is an article uh, that I found at the U of L archives, and it'll probably take me a couple videos to go through a lot of this. Uh, it's all current right now, especially since, man, I'm 30 years old and I went to U of L, and you know there are some good educators there, and they taught me this and that, uh, and I learned stuff. But overall, I feel like my education as an American has been shitty. From the day I was born till the, till today, all the way up from my college years, high school years, on down to the kindergarten years, I did do jump start. I did do uh, kindergarten or uh, um, some classes at the library, but that's it. You know, from from ever since I've been five years old till up till today, I've never been in a class that it embraces democracy, that embraces everybody's viewpoint and vision, uh, where it's a conversation, it's a dialogue, and where that group of people makes a consensus-based decision. I've never seen democracy in America, and it frustrates me being a political science major. I think about these politics all the time, and when I look at Kentucky and I say Kentucky's not a democracy, it's not. I mean, it's um, 11 or 12 percent. 11% voted in the primaries this year, and 25% uh, had voted in the governor's race of last year. So these that's a major race, 25% in a major race. I mean, this one coming up, I would say less than 50% of Kentuckians will vote, but less than 50 means that the majority of Kentuckians are not voting, so therefore we don't live in a democracy. Democracy is demosocracy, so demos is rule by the people. And if the majority of the people do not vote, that's what the majority of the people are saying. We don't participate in this government. We don't try. We don't do anything. We don't give a fuck. We don't give a fuck. So it's almost, it could be one of two ways. It could be a good sign. They like the way the system is, so they don't bother with it, or uh, they don't think they have any power. They don't have any choices. And if it's that second one, then that's, that's fucking bullshit. That's not right. And it would also be more accurate because they don't have... There aren't any, many good choices, and uh, not enough people are running for office either. So I wonder if people in Kentucky even know about their civics. I wonder if they have civics classes and if they're teaching government classes and uh, how to, you know, uh, what the Constitution enables uh, us Kentuckians to do. If it enables us to run for office. It enables us to, 
you know, reach for the stars and hopefully reform the system. It would be hard as fuck to have to get a new constitution. Um, so I think that, that would be a bad idea to get a new constitution. I think we should go back to the Kentucky Constitution. Um, be more, um, you know, originalist since it seems like the legislator and in, in the court system has taken Kentucky's constitution off path, has taken it um, elsewhere from where the original founders had wanted it because the original founders of Kentucky constitution were anti-corporate, anti-monopoly. Uh, they're friends of the working class. They're friends of the labor movement. They were anti-toll roads. Uh, we don't have any toll roads because of um, the uh, or because of the founders of the Constitution. So the Constitution also had a railroad commission. So they want to make sure big business was, you know was reined in and it was a populist sediment. It was a populist uh, constitutional document when it was written. And you know, like I said, thank goodness that it was written. Anyways, I'm gonna get to this. The uh, um, it's relevant because it's at U of L. I'm in Louisville and talking about you know uh, uh, things that are pertinent to Louisville. So I found this at U of L archives on the fourth floor in the back. They have all these um, different you know like uh, pictures and old things. But the uh, the student as nigger by Jerry Farber. I was looking for pictures of the um, 1960s protest uh, when U of L had some protests the uh, Gerald Neal and Blaine Hudson were both in the protest they were both in the black power protest at U of L uh, during the 60s it was um, you know it was a crazy time uh, Gerald Neal even said that he got arrested I think uh, Dean Hudson got arrested several of them almost had their um, almost got kicked out so they almost had all their stuff kicked out and they're thrown out and, but eventually, Dean Hudson is now the dean of the Arts and Science Building at UofL, so he's number one. He occupied the dean's office at uh, UofL Arts and Science Buildings, and he never left, so he's been occupying for 30 years. That's the dean, uh, uh, Dean um, Blaine Hudson, J. Blaine Hudson, who uh, awarded me an award, actually, which I appreciated. Um, so Jay Blaine Hudson is U of L dean, and then Gerald Neal is a very accomplished man. I did not realize how accomplished he was until I did a little research on him. Uh, he's the first African American senator in Kentucky, um, but, but there's much more than that. He's got so much education. He has a lot of uh, 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 distinguishing uh, characteristics, and currently he is a uh, state senator now. He's running for re-election. So. Those are two black students that had protested in the 1960s and see how they have, you know, they've excelled. They've gone far. They've done a lot of really good things. And so since um, they've been able to be successful in their own lives, I don't think we should be criminalizing or making people that are protesting, especially if they're peaceful protesters, especially if they're peaceful protesters in America, okay, P peaceful protesters in America at an American institution. Where do all these movements start? They start at the fucking colleges, and if the colleges aren't... Uh, getting the students up out of their chairs, if they're not allowing free speech and free association and organization, then, you know, what the fuck are they doing? What the fuck are they doing? Are they trying to stop people from organizing and being friends and having networks and coalitions? And if they are, that's some bullshit, because I would assume if you're on campus, you would have more freedom. But that is the exact opposite true. <laughs> that, is the, that is not true at all. I'll do a minute of this. Okay, so, students are niggers. When you get that straight, our schools begin to make sense. It's more important, though, to understand why they're niggers. If we follow that question seriously enough, it will lead us past the zone of academic bullshit where dedicated teachers pass their knowledge onto a new generation into the nitty-gritty of human needs and hang-ups. And from there, we can go on to consider whether it might ever be possible for students to come up from slavery. First, let's see what's happening now. Let's look at the role students play in what we like to call education. At Cal State LA, where I teach, the students have separate and unequal dining facilities. Separate and unequal. I mean, this is back in the 60s. So some of these things don't work, but some of these things are very relevant. I take them. Oh, no, this is true. Students have separate and unequal dining facilities. So the students have different dining facilities than the professors. Um, we all have the same dining, I think. I've never seen, actually, the professors eat along with us. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe maybe they have uh, actually different quarters at the. I don't really know about that if that's true or not. Um, yeah. So so more coming up with the student as nigger, and I'll stick with the text so I can uh, be able to read most of this by Jerry uh, Farber. Jerry Farber, 
the student as nigger.